Up next, we have Dustin Godsey from the Milwaukee Bucks. Dustin is the chief marketing officer and is entering his eighth season with the Bucks in his third year with the C as a CMO. Godsey oversees all aspects of marketing and advertising, including digital platforms, live events, promotions, and creative services for the Bucks, Pfizer Forum, and Deer District. Please put your hands together for Dustin. Hello, how is everybody? Can you hear me all right? We good? All right. Cool. Well, thank you all for having me. This is exciting for me for a number of reasons. One, it's just good to, to get out and, and speak and get away from the office a little bit. Um, you know, it's fun for me. I haven't been to Whitewater in about 22 years. Um, you know, came here actually as a high school student to a math competition a number of times on a, on a traveling math team. So um, it was fun to, to see the campus again and, and get through here. Um, but, but more than all, it's just, more than anything, it's just really fun, you know, as I go through this presentation, you're not going to see me talk about what our Gen Z strategy is. You're not going to see what our campaign for Gen Z is, because Gen Z is defining what we do as a marketing as a whole. You guys are the next generation of fans. You guys are, are the group that we are looking at, that we're building, and, and truth be told, it, what speaks to you guys, while there might be different channels and different ways to go through this, you know, if it speaks to you guys, it's gonna to speak to an older audience because believe it or not, we actually wanna be cool too. Um, so we're, we're watching those trends, we're seeing what you're doing, we're going through. So while we don't, you're not gonna see this is our Gen Z campaign, you're gonna see that the things we do are geared towards audiences like yourselves as we go through and how we develop what our products are, what our experiential things are, and how we're telling those stories. And so I think to start off with, I'm actually gonna start a video about what the Milwaukee Bucks are not. Oops. Maybe. All right, I think you know what this is and who we are. It's this and this, this guy, this place, you know, jerseys, tall guys, squeaky shoes, just a basketball team. But we're not just a basketball team. When you're just a basketball team, you play in an arena. But we built a home, and not just for basketball. We booked Mickey Mouse, Modest Mouse, Monster Trucks, Elton John, Justin Timberlake. We got to meet Justin. When you're just a basketball team, you have a parking lot. We have an outdoor living room. And we can have a lot of people over for drinks or parties or festivals or for the holidays. And these guys are on TV a lot. Love those guys. It's fun to party at our place, but we like to come to your place too. Hey, need a backpack? Need a high five? These hoops were due for an upgrade anyways. So before you couldn't find Bucks gear, now Bucks stuff is everywhere. Here, there, even on this little guy. Seriously, everywhere. Fact, there are more NBA fans in China than there are people in America. And they really, really love us. One more, here we go. Everyone else loves us too. They watch us, they wear us, they play us. You know you can go pro playing video games, right? Well, we have one of those teams too. We're not just a basketball team. We cross lines, cross continents. We know how to cross over. Oh. So in conclusion, we do this thing, we do that thing, a bunch of other things, things over here, things up there, things way over there. We're not just a basketball team. And we're just getting started. So there we are, we aren't just a basketball team. That's kind of our core product, but over the last few years we've evolved, we've changed a lot as we've gone through. You've seen, saw some recognizable faces in there. Obviously, people in here mostly probably recognize Giannis. That is kind of the, the face of our franchise and the face, face of our organization right now, but it goes way beyond that. And, and actually where I'm gonna start is internally as a, a company. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of history, how we got to where we are right now, and then go through some of our, our current kind of strategies and, and what we're looking at and how we're, how we're out there marketing and, and showcasing our, our products. But you know, at the basis of it all, we're a company. And you know, right now, we're doing a lot of hiring. We've built our team over the last, really, I started with the Bucks seven years ago. I think we had about 50 full-time staff. Right now, we're right at under 400. You add in all of our part-time staff, all of our vet staff, all of that, you know, we're up into the thousands. So you know, we're currently hiring, and a lot of what we're hiring is Gen Z. So you know, for us, Transparency in what we do in our organization is not. There we go. 
um, transparency in what we do is, is everything from our marketing to how we, how we organize ourselves as an organization. So one of the things I always like to start off with is just sort of our guiding principles as a company. This is with our employees, and this is also in our marketing, and this is in the stories we're telling. And these are, are really the eight things that, that we set ourselves up for and that you know, we think if we follow these principles in, in how we hire people, how we talk within the organization, how we market, that's gonna ring true and that's gonna be authentic no matter who our audience is. So you know, the big one and the most important thing is be present or don't show up. You know, if you're not dedicated to what you're doing, if you're not there, if your mind is somewhere else, don't come. Don't be a part of what you're doing. You'll find something else to do. Set ridiculously high standards. For our organization, we want to be a championship caliber organization. That means being the best marketing team, that means being the best sales team, that means bringing that shiny gold trophy home this June to Milwaukee. Include everyone, people first. You know, for us, our, from our president on down, he says the most important thing we have in our company is not our logo, it's not Giannis, it sort of is Giannis, but it's the people. And it's, that is where everything starts, it's the people. If people aren't bought in, if people aren't a part of what we're trying to do as a mission, they can go find something else to do, that's fine. You can go do spend your entertainment dollars somewhere else. You can spend your time on YouTube watching something other than our highlights. You can do a lot of things, but it's about those people first. Understand that culture happens with or without you. That's where the Gen Z thing and where you guys are speaking to us comes from. You're setting the culture. You're driving what the culture is. That culture is going to happen whether we sit back and we continue to just run the same 30-second TV spots. We you know, keep running the, the same ticket promotions, the same content. The culture is going to move on whether we're ready for it or not, and you'll see in a few minutes how, how that nearly lost the team from Milwaukee. Make sure, your words <clears throat> Sorry. Make sure your words match your actions. You saw this a little bit as they were talking, as um, Chris and Elke were talking about authenticity and going through. You guys are going to know if we're doing something just to say, hey, this is for the young kids, this is to be cool. You're going to smell that out. You're going to know. Our actions, what we do, have to, have to live up to that. Uh, best and most effective form of social media is the face-to-face -face relationship. Or in our case, it's experiences. It's about you know, what you do. People still want to be social. People still want to interact with each other. That's why the events business is doing better than it's ever done before. You know, that's why when I come into a room like this, you know, in my line of business, the fact that there aren't empty seats brings a smile to my face. Empty seats make me nervous. But, but people still love that social interaction. Um, the next one. Uh, this is actually the sanitized version. This isn't what our internal one says, but uh, don't be a jerk, be nice. Pretty simple rule to live by there. And then, you know, no matter what you're doing, work your butt off. And that's, you know, what we believe as we're going through and doing this. Again, we could spend a lot of money and do things that are, are much easier, but as we go through our marketing, it's we want to create things, we want to create experiences that are harder for us to do, it's harder for us to pull off, but it's going to be more authentic and it's going to resonate a lot more. So I'm going to take a step back about five years. Um, we had a new ownership team come in uh, five years ago, like I said. I started with the organization um, in 2012, coming off an NBA lockout. At that point in time, uh, the team hadn't um, really had, we, we were marketed as an NBA team. We were the NBA team in Milwaukee. If you lived in Milwaukee and you liked the NBA, you came to the Bucks games. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of people did that. Um, we weren't out building a brand. I was actually the first person the Bucks had hired to be a marketer in 45 years. So there was no marketing department. There was no talk about the brand. It was simply a transaction. You wanted to buy a ticket. We sold you a ticket. You came to the games. So we had new ownership come in. You know, they looked at a number of, of areas of the business. You know, the physical plant. We had, biz we had offices in four different places, again, for 60 people. So <laughs> within Milwaukee, 60 people spread out over four offices. Our practice facility was literally in a church gym uh, with leaky roof. Um, and we had you know, the oldest arena in the NBA, and it was not exactly somewhere that was um, you know, not real Instagrammable with, with nothing but gray cinder block walls um, and nothing really around it. We you know, so went out, got local engagement, changed the organizational structure, brought things together, and then went into a, a big rebrand. So out with the old and with the new, um, Last year, we opened the new uh, Pfizer Forum. How many Wisconsinites here have been to Pfizer Forum? Very good. Nice to see. Thank you. Um, practice facility, again, it's about the people. 
the players are our most valuable people in terms of what we're paying, what they mean to the product and going through. So we got rid of that um, the high school gym in the ba basement of a church, moved into a new 80,000 square foot state-of-the-art training center and going through, investing in that research and development. And remember, our players are all pretty much all Gen Z. We've got a couple older guys now. Um, but for the most part, they're all younger, starting with our star. You know, they're out being those influencers and talking about these things, taking photos, posting things. You know, so we want that. I mean, from a brand standpoint, that's as big of a brand touch point as anything is. That's where these guys basically live. And so that's where you know, you're seeing things. So we want to make sure that we're portraying that, that state-of-the-art high, um, high class you know, within that. And then the business offices, boring stuff, but from those five offices into one new 20,000 square foot open floor plan. And so, you know, what did that mean to, to not have marketing, to not, you know, to be that transactional, not look into, you know, actually speaking to a younger generation? Uh, from, you know, at the point in time that, that the new owners came in, we were last in the NBA on the court, and we were last in the NBA in basically every business line that you could measure um, within the NBA. So we were terrible in ticket sales. We had no merchandise sales. We were selling $140,000 a year in merchandise. We had fewer than a million social media followers. It was, it was bad news. These numbers aren't gonna mean anything to you, but you know, we'll come back to this a little bit, but you know, average attendance in 2013-14, fewer than 10,000 people. We had 5,000 season tickets. Nobody was watching us on TV, and again, not much in the way of social media following. And so that's when things changed. So new ownership came in, we really took a look, and we said, how can we redefine what this organization is, how can we become less transactional? How can we become something that people actually want to be a part of, whether they like basketball, whether you know, they're just looking for something to do in Milwaukee, or you know, again, as you saw in that, that original video, worldwide. How are we branding ourselves? How are we putting things out? And so we took a completely re refreshed look. We tore everything down from a brand standpoint, um, brought in a, an agency that you know, really was, had never worked in sports before, but had worked in merchandise and apparel. Because we knew that you know, if we designed things that people actually wanted to wear, that was gonna be a way for us to get our brand out. We created um, new fan experiences, not only through digital innovation, but the, just through opening up our brand to people. So we went for the first two years after that rebrand, after new ownership came in. We still weren't great on the court. We still weren't you know, a product people were clamoring for. So we took our players on the road. We visited you know, cities all over the state of Wisconsin. We opened up, we had free block parties, things just for people to come in where we weren't saying, come buy a ticket. We said, hey, come hang out with us. We've got local bands. We've got local artists. We've got that sort of thing. You might not you know, care about the bucks, but we're gonna have other things just to, to get you down here and get you involved in, in what we're doing. And then you know, using technology in a different way. Um, you know, this right here for, the, for some of the older of you, um, you know, we've, this last year we launched through technology what we called the beer button. So you're sitting at your seat. This is now Uber for, Uber for beverages, right? You're sitting there, two clicks. I want two, push the button, Apple Pay, boom, beer's at your seat in less than three minutes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the, the merchandising, redesigning the apparel, um, extended distribution, $2 million in, from 2012 to 14, $2 million in merchandise sales to $5 million last year. So that's the kind of growth that, that we've underseen. And you see these numbers now, it's just kind of staggering where we've been, or where we've come over those years. And a lot of that comes down to Pfizer form, right? So take a step away, we're not just a basketball team. What we want to do is create a place for social engagement for people who, again, maybe didn't care about basketball, but they like concerts, they like family shows. Um, maybe you just want to come down to, to one of the bars and restaurants uh, on the plaza. We want to become that central hub for recreation. So whether or not you care about Giannis or the Bucks or, or sports at all, this is a place now in, in Milwaukee where you can gather, where you can be together with people um, and experience those events and um, those things that you can't do, you know, connected to your phone and go through. And so we've seen great results. Uh, first year of Pfizer Forum, over 1.7 million fans, 35 regular season sellouts, uh, 43 total, um, and Marquette, you know, college basketball team, also moved over, 
And remember, the Pfizer Forum is actually smaller than the Bradley Center was. We took away 2,000 seats and still the most sellouts and, and large attendance in history for Marquette. And again, some, some bragging numbers here. Um, but again, it, it, what we do, it, it goes through everything. I mean, the, the first bird-friendly arena, um, <laughs> odd, but again, going back to your actions, meeting your words. We want to be forward-thinking. We want to be green. We want to care about the environment. We had um, a bird organization come to us and say, you guys realize you're building this big glass building right in the middle of um, the migratory paths for a number of bird species. You're going to absolutely kill them as they come through because uh, they're going to fly right into this glass. So we worked with our engineers and, and quickly just figured out a way to, to put some fritting on the glass so that the birds can see it. And we, we're now officially licensed as the, the first bird-friendly arena in North America and the world. Um, and as you go through, obviously you put a real estate project like that together, you're going to win some awards there. Um, but you know, what we really love is you know, we've won the award in the NBA for the most innovative technology and um, in you know, kind of the stadium world as the, uh, for the business venue technology award, just the way we, we use everything and then pull everything together. And again, for us, it's, it's entertainment, right? So um, our artists, whether they are in Gen Z or not, are trying to reach Gen Z. So Travis Scott, um, definitely a Gen Z artist, uh, came through, it was the first hip hop show uh, in Milwaukee, actually downtown in almost two decades. Um, Travis Scott is very particular. Uh, when he gets to a venue, he wants his experience to be right for him, uh, to get him in the right frame of mind to go on stage. Um, so we wanted to make sure that he had a great experience coming through. Again, it's all about those experiences, no matter it's, it's one person or 20,000. And so, you know, down in this corner, you can't really see it. You know, this is kind of the stuff we set up, kind of circus themed backstage. Um, but one touch we had was we have a, a real narrow hallway that goes from where the artists park into the, the dressing rooms. Um, and so we decided we were going to turn that into a planetarium. So we rented all this planetarium stuff. We had this, you know, kind of trippy lighting through there, had this cool, like, ethereal music going. And it absolutely blew his mind. Uh, and he went out and now next to her he's going to think about coming back to Milwaukee again. I mean, that's just the, the sort of thing we're trying to do. This middle one, um, I'll be honest with you, we, we had a lot of consternation. Um, we decided that, you know, one of the things that we do is we like to give a gift to our artists when they come through. Um, just to, again, make them feel at home, differentiate Milwaukee from other places. So we said, what would be more Wisconsin, more Milwaukee than giving these artists a giant cheese sculpture, um, whether it's of them or, you know, when the Jonas Brothers came through, it was actually of all their wives. Um, <laughs> so this massive cheese sculpture, and uh, so our, our arena marketing director came to this idea, and I said, it's great, can they do it, can they pull it off? She said, yeah, they, they're really confident. So the first one we did was Carrie Underwood, um, and it, it comes in, and she, she opens it up, and she calls me absolutely panicked. Um, because we just spent this, spent I think $2,400 on a giant block of carved cheese, and it's honestly the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the picture doesn't even really justify how, how terrifying this is, but it's based off of uh, Carrie Underwood's Cry Pretty album artwork, so you know, all the crying, blood, tears, whatever. That's all right from the artwork, so it is kind of, it did kind of replicate that, but, so we're sitting there, we have a decision, we're like, can we even actually give this to her? Like, we're gonna scrap it, we'll just cut it up and we'll eat it ourselves. Like, <laughs> so we're actually in a back room. Her manager, tour manager comes by as we're like panicking about this, sees it, stops what she does. She wasn't even coming into the room. She just pauses, turns in, comes in. And she's like, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Carrie has to see that. So she brought Carrie in. This is actually Carrie's uh, Instagram post about it. Um, you know, 142,000 likes at that point in time. It ends up um, on Good Morning America. It ends up in People Magazine. You know, those sorts of things where it's, you know, you take these little risks trying to create this, you know, fun environment. Um, sometimes you don't know how it's going to turn out, but sometimes it turns out uh, well. And then, you know, when Pink came through, this was actually before Carrie, uh, by about a week, she was the first female headliner at the at Pfizer Forum. So we made sure to play that up a lot, and she blasted that, that out everywhere. And, that was really impactful and really important to her. 
So that's kind of everything around the Bucks. I want to take the last 15 minutes here um, just to go through some of the Bucks specific things before we open up to questions. So, you know, I kind of built this around, you know, three different things as I've kind of talked through here um, in terms of, of what we do, um, really kind of reaching out that are the core of a lot of what our business has become now. Um, and just kind of show you how, you know, this, you know, the Gen Z strategy and how we built this audience kind of starting from the digital first and starting from a younger audience and kind of building out from there. So as I mentioned, uh, seven years ago when I started, we weren't selling any gear. A lot of that, I don't know if you got, if any, those of you who are from the Milwaukee area or uh, NBA fans, you know, our logo was terrible. Um, our colors were great in December, um, green and red, but when you mix those two things together on a shirt or a jacket or a hat, uh, you look like you were celebrating Christmas year round. Um, it was awful, just awful bad. Um, on top of that, we didn't have a strategy around it and we basically just sold your traditional you know, logo polo or logo sweatshirt or going through. So we've really taken a lot and, and kind of diversified and gone through as we look at, at our merchandise strategy into number one, using our faces on our team. Um, we do a photo shoot every year now with our players where traditionally that's you know, players coming in in their jerseys doing their boring action shots and, and going through. But we do is we actually line up racks of gear. And we say, you know, go over there, pick out four or five of your favorite things, put it on, we can do a, a little photo shoot with them. That not, not only allows us to attach a face that people recognize to our advertising around the, our merchandise, but it actually informs what we're gonna buy and what we're gonna sell. Because these guys are driving culture as much as anybody in the NBA right now, they are at the forefront. And so we see what they like, what they gravitate towards, and that informs what we're gonna order and what we're gonna do moving forward. Um, looking into to simple things, you know, back to school, Herschel bags, you know, things like that, just different ways to, to branch out into, you know, kind of your everyday life that isn't, you know, I'm going to a game so I have to, to throw on my jersey. It's how can we be a part of everything? And then the thing that I'm really, you know, kind of the most proud of and, and the thing that we've put a lot of time into is, um, you know, taking risks with our brand where it's not just again, putting our logo on things, um, but opening that up to, to our fans and, and having designs created by people outside of the world of sports. So four years ago, we started a program called Milwaukee Originals. And what that program is, is we actually find at, uh, local, at that point in time, it was just local small t-shirt companies who, quite honestly, a lot of them in the past, um, if they saw Milwaukee Bucks calling them, they would get sweaty and nervous because that meant that you know, they designed something that they were selling at their, their little shop that they were about to get a cease and desist letter from. Um, but we were actually calling them saying, hey, you guys have a cool style, you have a cool following, you have a great brand, why don't you design something for us and sell it, we'll work together. And we actually got four or five of these t-shirt companies together because they're all competitors for the first time, took them out to lunch and said, hey, like, you guys should get to know each other, you're doing cool things in the, this small city, get to know each other. And then, you know, here's our logos, here's our colors, do what you want. Um, that's turned into, you know, really something that we've branched off from every year into, you know, not only the Milwaukee Originals, now we have uh, college students who are designing hats for our giveaways. You know, that user-generated content is something that we're actually now taking and, and making it an authentic part of our brand. And then it comes down to, um, to jerseys and uniforms.
Uh, so we raised a lot of eyebrows last year when we unveiled a bright yellow, orange, and red uniform. Um, our older fans who, who remember the Mecca, so the inspiration behind this uniform is in the, the 70s, the Bucks actually played on a painted yellow, orange, red basketball court. Uh, it was created by um, an artist named Robert Indiana. Uh, he created the Love Statue, a bunch of other things in the 70s, he was a very popular pop artist. Somebody in Milwaukee decided um, that, you know, at that point in time, color TV was just kind of, kind of coming to the forefront. These small little TVs that said, we need something that when people turn on the TV and they see basketball, that immediately they recognize this as Milwaukee. So they created this big, giant piece of pop art that, um, that the team played on. So, you know, we've used that through some of our stuff over the years. We've had throwback nights. We actually went back to the Mecca and a couple years ago and played on a replica of that court. Um, created some controversy with Kyrie Irving, um, all that sort of thing. But, you know, as we're going through right now with Nike as our partner, every year we unveil a new what's called the City Edition uniform. Um, you know, a lot of teams have been very safe with these, you know, kind of throwing a city nickname, um, you know, that sort of thing. They came to us and said, you know, the Mecca was cool. The Bucks used to have this really kind of, um, you know, forward thinking brand and style. Why don't you do something with this? And so I was immediately hooked. Um, and so, you know, we create this bright yellow jersey that, again, is really more focused towards a younger generation in terms of wearing it. Not a lot of old people are, are wearing these, gonna go out and clamor for this, this bright yellow jersey. So as we unveiled it, though, we couldn't just say, here's this cool jersey that has no tie to our, our brand or, or anything, you know, young people go out and buy it, please, because it's cool. We wanted to tie it and actually tell the story because for the most part, I mean, how many of you guys knew the Mecca story before that, about the court. So not too many. <laughs> so there's a, a big disconnect there. So we wanted to make sure that we're telling that history, showing that this wasn't just a, a play for you know, trying to be hip and cool, but trying to be hip and cool. Uh, and what this turned out to was the fastest selling um, line of merchandise in, in team history. Um, we wore this uniform, I think, for six games um, at home. By the fifth game, you couldn't actually buy the jerseys anymore. The hoodies, the hats, everything else were gone immediately. Um, and as you go through and you look at our events still, uh, as we had our, our summer you know, Giannis MVP thing, the amount of yellow in the crowd was, was kind of astonishing. Um, and now we're gonna you know, take that all away and, and do something new again this year. The second part, the second thing, um, gaming, is you know, another new way for us to, to expand in a new audience that is, is definitely younger, is spending a lot more time playing video games. Um, and, you know, kind of gives me a little bit of satisfaction in that, you know, I told my mom a lot when I was younger that I was going to grow up to, to play video games for a living, um, and she didn't believe me, but now that's actually something that, that can be done. So uh, three years ago, the NBA started um, the 2K League to, to really start to reach out a little bit to the esports uh, crowd that has gone on. Esports, tournaments, uh, Overwatch League, uh, those sorts of things have become some of the not only highest attended events in the world, um, but some of the highest events in terms of, of streaming, uh, online population, people watching. It's insane, you know, the number of people I went from, you know, we spent a lot of nights in dorm rooms when I was in college, watching our friends play GoldenEye and play video games, but to now it's, it's a billion dollar, billions of dollars industry, millions of people across the world streaming and watching this stuff. Um, and so we took the jump a couple years ago when the NBA offered this opportunity, not really, Knowing what it is, we're still figuring out a lot of it. Um, we're not making money off of it, I assure you of that. Um, but we're connecting with different audiences, and it's allowing us to, to really stretch into to storytelling in a way that, that traditional NBA doesn't always let us. And we are live here at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, for the 2019 NBA 2K League Draft. And folks, Season two is coming your way. The sixth overall pick in the NBA 2K League Draft. Bucks Gaming selects Bondo, Slay Island, Chatty Nick, RSD, Louisiana. These guys are going to put in the time, they're going to watch film, they're going to communicate, and it's going to be everything we wanted from season one. Long stretch, but we're here. He'll do it. That's on me.
about to head to Kohler. It's a five-star destination. The resort's really nice, and we're gonna have time to kind of bond as a team before the season starts. This is honestly for Bucks Gaming, keeping it real. This is a team I thought was going to be the worst team in the league. The cards. Rooks. They give it to Pondo. Back to Rooks for three for the tie. He got it. And Rooks is tied. Under five now. Rooks at the free throw line to win it. Time. A Rooks with 41. Retained Big Meek. Retained A Rooks. They get the foul on drop off. I want to call him the Meek Freak. Is, is, is that, can that be a thing? Plano with a post score. He'll pop it. Fades away on four guys. Uh, refocus our game plan is. You're seeing uh, another special player when it comes down to using this build, Plondo. Plondo with its badge, so it's automatic right now for Plondo. Activated his pure rim badge. Okay. And that's a green. This thing's about to be a flood. Spectacular coming in from Chatty Nick. We're seeing here to try to make a pass. Chatty Nick now from deep. Chatty Nick makes the shot. Eight of ten shooting four, six from downtown. If you're a tight, you just got to keep your hands up. Oh, oh my. Huge three. It's an over to got a 2K. He pops his badge. Oh. It gets blocked by RSG. Back the other way. Slate Island. Oh, we use the window. I mean, so I'll be honest with you, I don't really get it. Um, <laughs> to me, it's not, you know, kind of, it's, it's not basketball, it's not, and these guys are way better at video games than I ever, ever was, so I don't really even understand from that standpoint. But, you know, it, it is a way, and in, you know, 2K is really a way that people begin watching basketball now. I, I mean, even in, in my generation, I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. I became a Saints fan from playing Madden 90 something or other. Um, so this is really where people kind of figure out the teams they like, figure out what's cool, go through. And so this has now become an extension for us where we're investing real money, we're investing real time, we've got staff, real production into, you know, again, being where the culture is and being where those audiences are and just making sure, uh, you know, again, a 13-year-old kid may not have ever picked up a basketball or care about basketball, but he's probably played 2K. And so he's seeing our brand, he's seeing now these guys who we treat just like we do the NBA players, they have their own training facility, we have great housing, they work with our training staff, they work with our dietitians to make sure that they're you know, in uh, competition form and going through. So it's you know, become a, just a different level, a different way for us to, again, authentically be where the culture is and be able to build and, and grow from there. And then the last one of, of kind of our three Gs today, gear, gaming, and you know, the, the most important one, the Greek freak. Um, you know, had a lot of thoughts about, you know, the image to put up here um, is kind of introduce Giannis, who doesn't necessarily need introduction. Uh, but this is from, you know, obviously he won the MVP last year. Uh, the NBA a few years ago decided to go away from, you know, they used to announce awards and present them in front of the home fans during the playoffs or di during different things. Uh, they've gone away from that and, and have now created this, you know, made for TV show, awards show. Um, which is great, gets a lot of eyeballs, it's great for the league, but for us, um, you know, we had such great support this last year, we built so many great things, and so much of our brand has become about those events and the, those opportunities for people to come together and share in what we do from a day-to-day -day basis. We wanted to make sure that, that our fans got an opportunity to, to celebrate with Giannis. Um, so we worked with Nike, this was right after his shoe launch, um, and it was a Sunday evening, like four o'clock, uh, in the middle of June, had no idea, you know, kind of what turnout there would be. We had no idea what to expect, um, and we just said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna throw this party for Giannis. Come out, you know, join us as we go through this. Um, and we had over 20,000 people uh, show up. You get a little pit in your stomach, pit in your stomach every time you have these free events because there's no tickets. You have no real idea of of who's gonna show up. And so, about an hour before, you're just like, what if what if it's me like hanging out with Giannis? Um, but Luckily, that didn't turn out to be the case. Again, about 20,000 people show up. It was you know, overwhelmingly you know, a very young crowd. 
Uh, you see a lot of the yellow uh, popping up in through there. Um, and it's these sorts of things where people just getting that opportunity to, to feel like they're a part of something, to be a part of you know, a greater community, to be a part of these events. Um, and not just the people in the crowd, but Yana's. And this is a big thing about what's changed from how we tell our stories, how we connect with people and what we do. And again, where your generation and, and millennials have really driven how we tell stories and go through. You know, in my day, if I wasn't there, I would have learned about this on the six o'clock news, probably you know, around 625 going into the sports, sports uh, segment there, you know, talking through and recap, you know, the Bucks threw a party for Giannis, a bunch of people showed up, right? News is still there, they're still part of that. But for us now, it's everything about content. We've built our content team, our creative team, uh, 4X in the last couple years, just to, to build up and to be able to tell these stories. And because not only do you wanna be there um, and be a part of what's going on, you also wanna know what it's like on the other side. What it's like for Giannis to experience this. What's he thinking about, what's he doing? And now we can give you access into to what that looks like and feels like. Do you mind if we brief you for a quick five minutes? Yeah, sure. It'll be really quick. Yeah. So you're going to go out on stage probably around like 3.15, 3.20. We'll introduce you. Jim Paschke is going to be up there uh, welcoming you to the stage. All season long, you have been chanting three letters at five short four. Those are the letters. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2019 Kia NBA MVP, Giannis Adonacumbo. It's kind of heavy. It's heavy. Where's your guys? Please do me this favor so I can be better. I can be a better player. I can lead this team to a championship. Please don't call me MVP until I win it again next year. I'm gonna call my brothers on stage and we're gonna take an iconic selfie video so I can watch it. I can watch for the rest of my life and remember this day. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's do that, come on. You guys come up. Okay, okay, uh, I got it ready. I got it ready, okay, 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 okay. Let's do it, you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Let's go, let's do it, let's do it! Thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, hey, let's go get the big trophy now. Show you. The 2019 Kia NBA Most Valuable Player goes to Giannis Antetokounmpo. First of all, you know, I want to thank God. I want to thank my teammates. Uh, I want to thank the, the front office, the ownership, for believing in me. And I was 18 years old. Thank you, it is. Giannis, yo, G. Giannis, what's good, boy? Just want to say congratulations on an amazing season. Congrats on the NBA MVP. Congrats on the MVP, bro. Hey, congrats on the MVP. Congrats on winning MVP, brother. Congratulations, Yanni, for winning the MVP, the most valuable player of the year 2019. And again, congratulations for being the best male athlete of the year. We are very proud of you. I'm very proud of you because you have made me a proud mom. Thank you so much. God bless you. We love you. We love you. Thank you. Now you know a little bit what it feels like 
for the MVP to go out and, and be welcomed by 20,000 people can be completely overwhelmed and, and go through. Um, and you also get a little bit of a sense, if you weren't there, of what it felt like to be in that moment. Um, and that's really what it's about, right? So what we sell on the Bucks side, Pfizer form, everything, is experience. You know, the, uh, Chris Nalke talked about it. It's about experience. It's about experiencing things in real life, but then also how we're telling those stories. Um, you didn't see in this as we went through campaigns. Or, I mean, this was, this was a lot of our marketing. This is what we do. Um, you didn't see prices, you didn't see ticket offers, you didn't see you know, blatant advertising. That's not the way we talk, that's not the way you guys listen, that's not the way you guys communicate. So what we do for, on our day to day is go out, we wanna tell stories, we wanna encourage people, we want people to, to feel connected to our brand, whether they're in China, um, whether they're you know, living in the apartment that we are just about to open uh, on our, across the street from the arena. It's about those experiences, about how you share those things, and then how you go out in the world and tell those stories. So with that, uh, open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes, and then you guys can go eat lunch. So we're going to do the same thing with questions again this time. We'll have people walking up and down the aisles with the mics. You can just raise your hand and ask the questions. What's it like working with such a big company like Nike to get the message across of what you guys are trying to do? Uh, Nike is absolutely incredible. And when you talk about storytelling and um, really understanding you know, who, who their fans are, who, who their customers are, the stories that are going to resonate, um, there's nobody better. And I think you know, for us, the thing that's, I was actually a little bit nervous when, when the league, uh, Nike, reached their agreement um, in that we had just gone through this entire rebrand. I was really concerned from a brand standpoint that they were going to come in and you know, just sort of say, this, we're Nike, we have the research, this is what we did, you know, we're putting billions of dollars behind this, here's what your jerseys look like now. Um, but then you know, what I came to realize is that Nike's really smart about how they do things and they, you know, they wanted to help us amplify our stories. Um, so they came in. We've, I've had much more interaction with Nike than I ever did with Adidas when they were the jersey um, manufacturer. And now with Giannis, like, they get it. You know, this sort of event that, that we did wouldn't work in a lot of markets, but it works. It's so endemic to what Milwaukee is and what we're trying to build in Milwaukee that you know, they immediately said, yes, let's do that. That's exactly you know, what we should do. So they've been, they've been great. So correct me if I'm wrong, but Milwaukee's not the most traditional basketball market. Um, how have you managed to capitalize on the team's recent performance in a non-traditional basketball market? Yeah, uh, great point. Um, so, you know, it's the, the state from a sports standpoint uh, is definitely dominated by the Packers. Um, you know, we still don't schedule. We, we intentionally don't schedule games on Sundays in the first half of the season to you know, avoid any possible conflict with the Packers. Uh, we've got our open practice this Sunday um, that is at 2 o'clock to make sure that we're done by 3.15 so that people can leave and get out to our giant screens and our bars uh, to watch the Packers take on the Cowboys at 3.30. So there's certainly part of that that, that goes through that. Um, but for us, again, we, as we kind of went through and, and re-looked at what we were trying to do and, and the brand we wanted to be, it wasn't even really, I mean, you didn't really even see that much basketball in, in the presentation of what I did. That's not who we are. We are, you know, a community brand. We are as much about telling the stories of Milwaukee and, and our community uh, as we are about, you know, what happens on the court 41 nights a year. Um, so as soon as we sort of, you know, separated those two things, we could start to build a real brand and, and really start to, to talk to fans and build that. Obviously, you get a guy like Giannis, you get a 60-win season, you go to the Eastern Conference Finals. Suddenly, my job changes a lot this year as I'm not, you know, we're basically sold out for every game already. Um, you know, I'm not worried about hustling tickets and, and going out and selling, you know, figuring out what discount's going to get people here on a Monday night. Um, but what I think what we're doing right now is we're building the next generation of fans, right? So sports are cyclical. Um, you're going to be up, you're going to be down. The results, I think, the true results, I think, from what we're doing right now, um, we won't see for another five or ten years when that down cycle, you know, hopefully it takes that long, um, comes back again, where we have a little bit more of a dedicated fan base than we did at that point. Great question. 
Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the Bucks got a little bit of uh, consulting help uh, in their past when it was a little bit less successful to kind of uh, stimulate some ideas for the brand and the organization. Uh, my question is, how typical is that for um, a, uh, an organization like the Bucks to reach out to a consulting organization, or is that kind of something that only happens in, when they're in a rut? Yeah, I think it's there's there's a variety of different things, um, different ways to look at it. And I think, you know, throughout the NBA, there's a lot of different models. There are teams who um, haven't really resourced internally to, you know, have kind of a, a full agency feel inside their their organization to where they're hiring agencies constantly and, and going through there. Um, we had actually previous to to um, me coming in, that had kind of been us. Again, we didn't have a marketing department, so it was just kind of pay somebody else to to go and do it. So. But I think for us, you know, we we know um, we don't have we don't always have the best ideas, so it's important to get different voices and come through. So whether that's again using you know user fan generated content and you know bringing people in and paying them to to help us you know on that sort of micro level uh, to going out and, and finding agencies that you know can give us a little bit different insight and you know at the end of the day we we mostly do all the work in in house. Um, but it's good to get those different perspectives and different things to kind of drive us because you can get kind of in a, a creative rut of you know where you're at and, and the way you're looking at things. All right, are there any other questions? All right, let's give Dust. Oh, you have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> How did you find your way to your position in the company? Um, so. You know, I get asked that question a lot. Like, how do I how do I get your job? Um, there is no there is no training program. There's no way to to specifically get there. Um, you know, I think the way I found it. So, I grew up in a small town in Iowa. Um, went to the University of Iowa. Um, had no idea that this would be when I started there. I actually wanted to be a sports writer. Um, wanted to be a reporter. Um, quickly discovered that's not what I wanted to do, and had to figure out something else. Um, and so ended up with a, an internship with the minor league baseball team in their uh, media relations department, promotions, you know, doing everything from throwing t-shirts out to writing press releases. Um, then I moved, ended up in Des Moines, was on the arena side, was, uh, and then that took me to Philadelphia where I was running marketing for an arena outside of the sports stuff. So all I wanted to do was market sports, but I was marketing, you know, Disney princesses on ice and Ringling Brothers Circus and, and things like that that, I had no understanding or interest in at the time. I mean, you know, as a 26-year-old guy living in Philadelphia, like I knew way more about princesses than than I should have um, at that point in my life. Um, but it was those things and those experiences, and I, I. So I think, you know, for me, what I tell people is, you know, there is no straight line to to that dream job. Um, sometimes people are lucky to to kind of find their. I got lucky to to find my way into it a little bit. Um, but it's what you take out of those different experiences you go through. So, you know, you see a door, you see an opportunity, take it and just make sure that even if it's not what you envision yourself doing for the rest of your life, that you're learning from all those experiences and you're mentally thinking about, okay, how could I apply this to the specific thing that I want to do? Um, and then it's about you know, making contacts, meeting people. Um, and then within my organization, you know, we just kind of built, built through and it was, it was coming there. It was like I said at the beginning, being present you know, wanting to be there, setting yourself, even when the, the organization wasn't setting itself to high standards, setting yourself to ridiculously high standards, um, and working as hard as you can. So. All right, we'll take one last question. Yes. So talking about the community involvement aspects, like especially with the block parties, getting all the uh, fans and community um, involved, in the renovation of the Bucks brand, what has been your favorite uh, aspect of this or favorite event? Um, so my favorite event, there have been so many great things. I mean, the, the Killers concert last year, which was the first show uh, at the new arena, was incredible just because we'd spent two years of you know, being in this building every day and, and not doing our grand opening. But I, I think the, the one event that is always kind of the most memorable to me is, um, the season after the new ownership came in, when we went through our logo rebrand and that sort of thing, we, we had our first summer block party. Um, again, I talk about that pit in your stomach, not knowing if people are going to show up or not. 
Um, I mean, we had a, a massive setup. We, we took it away from the arena. We were actually in the center of our office park where our offices are. Um, and we were going to unveil our new uniforms that day. Um, and so, you know, we set all this up. We had digital RSVPs, but you never know who's going to come. And, you know, there was that, there was a lot of trust kind of put in me that, um, from our ownership and, and our team president that, you know, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to see, uh, you know, at that point in time, attendance at games was still, you know, sub 10,000. We weren't great yet on the court. Um, and, you know, 11 o'clock, the event start, is supposed to start at noon. 11 o'clock, people are just flooding into this, you know, out of the way office park to come through. We end up with 10 or 15,000 people on our front lawn of our offices just waiting to, to see this. And that was the point, I think, where, where we realized, OK, but there's something to this. this the, the direction we're going and the, the way we're talking about ourselves and what we're doing, it's resonating with people. This, this actually does mean something. And from there, it's just been you know, kind of to the moon. So. All right, all thank right, you all very give, much. Oh, so give them a round of applause.